Welcome to this week's Sunday Service Live. My name is Lee, I'm one of the pastors here, and it is my privilege to welcome you to church this morning. We're just so excited about what God's going to do this morning. We've got some great worship from our worship leader, Matt Bowman. We've got an awesome preach from Pastor Ryan Island. So just sit back, relax, and open your hearts to what God's going to do within all of us this morning. Let's just pray. Dear God, we just thank you for who you are. We're just so expectant about what you're going to do within all of us. Let your Holy Spirit just invade our homes and where we are and our places of work while we just listen and open to where you direct us. Be with us, we pray. Amen. So just sit back, relax, open your hearts and just engage with what God's going to do within all of us this morning. Great out of the darkness into your glory. 
being magnified Just let his praise arise Christ be magnified in me We sing it all Christ be magnified From the altar of my life Christ be magnified in me Thanks, Matt, for that great worship. Even though we're separated physically, there's still loads going on in the life of our church at the moment. So check out Church News to give you more information on what's going on and how you can be involved. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Church News. If it's your first time joining us online, we want to say a big, warm welcome to you. Here's what's coming up this week. Hi all, hope you're blessed and have had a lovely week. Just a quick reminder, the Kiss Church is back at 12 o'clock after our main service. It's on Facebook Live and on our YouTube channel. Kids, get ready for an amazing word. See you then. Hi Church, this coming Tuesday we are continuing our weekly time together to meet socially as a church family. It's a great way for us all to connect for a time of fun and fellowship. We will be meeting this Tuesday at 6.30 to 7.30 over on Zoom. We would love you to come and take part. To join us, please contact Church through our social media channels or email admin at elimnorthampton.com. We have some guest hosts this week. Join us to find out who they are. Church, just a reminder that this week at 7pm on our Facebook and YouTube channel will be our next prayer and worship evening. If you happen to have a prayer request, please will you email it through to admin at elimnorthampton.com or send us a message on Facebook or YouTube. It'd be great to see you then. Right, youth, we're back again this Friday for our Friday night youth meeting. Forget the dry knees. Make sure you get there 7.30 to 8.30. If you want the code, message us on our Instagram page or our Facebook page. See you there for some fun and prayer. Hey, you guys, uh, within this current situation that we're in, it's really important that we have your correct and up-to-date contact details. Uh, so your name, your email address, your phone number as a minimum. And so please, if any of these have changed within the past year, could you please email us at admin at elimnorthampton.com or even if you're unsure of whether we have your correct contact details, just email them through and we'll get them processed. We'd love just to be able to make sure that we have your correct contact details so that if there's any information with, with everything that's changing at the moment we'd love to send that through to you so get that done straight after today's service we'd really appreciate that thanks guys and that's it for this week church you can follow us on facebook and instagram or head to www.elamnorthampton.com for more information have a great week well, hello, my friends. Uh, it's great to be able to share with you today. If we haven't met before, my name's Ryan, uh, and I'm one of the pastors of the church here. It's just real my uh, my real privilege to be able to share with you uh, something that's been on my heart for a while. Uh, it's coming out of Matthew 5 uh, and the Beatitudes. If you haven't uh, got a Bible ready uh, and you want to get one ready, that's where we're going to be reading from. And we're going to be continuing with uh, today's Make It Better series. And so I believe we're in week eight, which is exciting that we've been in a series for so long. Uh, and as a church uh, and, as, and as Christians, as children of God, my prayer is today, we have something that we can go away with today's message and uh, really put into practice so that uh, collectively, as a group, that we can uh, we can say we're making it uh, better. Uh, it comes straight from uh, the Beatitudes, which is found in Matthew five, and it says these words: uh, "Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled." Uh, blessed are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are those who are, are pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say things of all kinds of evil, evil because of me and rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for the same way, uh, for in the same way they persecute the prophets before you. 
Uh, and I really just want to take one snippet uh, from uh, that, 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 group of, uh, that group of text is called the Beatitudes. Um, uh, and I really just want to take, say, take one bit of text. It's blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Uh, and I did some uh, some looking into this uh, a little while back, uh, and actually saw a a second way of which we can uh, we can look at that. This is my uh, all, uh, almost my my go to uh, Bible verse for when I conduct funerals. Uh, I've been asked to do a number of funerals now since I've been a, a minister, and it's it's a real beautiful verse that we can look to. Uh, because it speaks of God's heart, like God's character of how he, uh, of how he wants us to uh, come to him. And we see that he comforts us when we mourn, when we cry out uh, to him. It's almost like he's saying, it'll be all right. Everything will be okay. You know, we're going to get through this. It's that sort of statement that it's saying of, of how God uh, interacts with us. And as much as that is true, there's actually a second way in which we can look at this verse uh, because uh, uh, it's a great teaching moment, I believe, for us. And it points us to a new way in which we can interact with God and how we outwork our faith. Blessed are those who mourn. Uh, I'm sure there's, there's been situations in, that, in each one of us where we have uh, had times of which we are mourning. Uh, where something's happened, um, uh, but but is there a new kind of mourning that God wants us to do? Maybe a, a different kind of mourning, uh, not necessarily a, a real grief type of mourning when we when we lose someone, but a type of mourning that changes us and transforms us from the inside out. Now you you may or may not know that the Bible itself, both the Old and the New Testament. Uh, was written in three languages. We have Aramaic, we have Hebrew, and then we also have the Old Testament. Uh, sorry, the New Testament, which is wrote in uh, which is wrote in Greek. Um, and sometimes when the the Bible is translated into the Queen's English, uh, then it's uh, we can lose some of the interpretation of that. We can lose some of the beauty of the original language in which it's written. So, for example, uh, in English, we have one word for love uh, and it's uh, and it's love. And so so I can say to my wife, Amy, I can say uh, to her, I love you, my wife. I can say to my best mates, yo, bro, I love you so much. Uh, I can say to, to the church, you know, we love meeting with you uh, and we miss it dearly. Uh, but actually, in the Greek language, there's seven different words for the word love. And we see four of those words uh, found in the Bible. Um, uh, and so it, it's, it's easy that we can uh, not necessarily misunderstand what the Bible is saying, but we don't necessarily get the depths of, of some of the literature uh, of how it was written. So uh, if we take love, for example, we may miss what kind of love they were talking about. So was the writer, when they said love, talking about a brotherly love? Uh, or was it talking about a passionate, driven love? Or was it talking about a love, uh, uh, or the kind of love that a parent would have over a child? And you see, when you get to grips with that, uh, we can understand how we may miss some of the intricacies of how uh, the Bible was, was written. Um, so then if we go back to today's verse, it says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. We can actually have a, a look at maybe a different meaning than what we may see on face value. Uh, and so some theologians uh, would suggest that the mourning that uh, is being talked about here is the, a mourning of the sin in our lives. Uh, and the reason why uh, that's believed is because a Greek word for mourning here is called pentheo. Uh, and that actually refers to an ongoing condition of mourning. Uh, and so not necessarily like a situation of grief or a situation of mourning, maybe when a loved one passes, uh, but it's actually a mourning, uh, a, a kind of lifestyle of it. Uh, and that's not saying that we need to be going around uh, sad all the time, 
But there may be situations in our life uh, or, 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 or things that we do from our lives that we may need to start crying out to God for uh, and almost mourning what we're doing in order to see God move uh, within our lives and come to him uh, for that strength to do so. Uh, it's referring to that us as Christians, we should be so affected by the sin that's in our lives that it actually caught, it causes us to turn to God uh, and cry out to him. Uh, uh, and I believe that, that, it get, then, that then what God does is he gives us the Holy Spirit to come and comfort us within those times. So, like I've already said, we are changed and transformed by God. Uh, so if you're watching today and, and you haven't uh, really, uh, you don't have much understanding of the Christian faith, you've not really been involved in it too much and you're thinking, well, what is sin? What is this sin word that he's talking about? Is it is it murder or is it stuff like that? Well, uh, essentially what it is, 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 is any time, uh, what sin boils down to is any time we put something above God. And so if we have God who is really high in our life, but then we place like, the value of money, for example, over that, uh, then, then we would say that that is, that is sin. Uh, if money, like the pursuit of money is, is sometimes a fantastic thing, doing what we can to, uh, to, to give our best and our excellence to God. Uh, but as long as sin stays underneath God in the prior, priority of our lives, that's okay. It's when it takes a, a greater priority that when we'd say you're falling into sin, you could say the same of our anger. You could say the same of, uh, of loads of different things, our comfort even. Uh, and so we want to we want to stay comfortable and we, we make that more important than God in our lives. We would say that that would be uh, uh, a sin. Uh, and so that's really what it boils down to. But if, if you don't have any understanding, then please feel free to get in contact with us to ask these sort of questions as you experience uh, and sort of experiment with with your faith. And so we see uh, then that uh, if, if God is wanting to, us to mourn our sin, what does that actually look like? Well, well, Old Testament uh, people, so they would be Jewish believers, uh, so like the pre-Jesus uh, times, uh, they would have done this. Uh, and so the prophet Joel, and so a prophet is someone who uh, hears or sees something from God with a message for his people. He says these words in Joel 1. Um, uh, he's speaking to the Israelites, the Jewish believers, and he says, put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. Wail, you ministers, before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and the drink offerings are withheld from the house of God. So let me explain what that means to us. Well, at this moment, the Israelites uh, would be living in a rebellious uh, way between them and God uh, because of their actions, their rebellions, because them them living in their sin, uh, they found their self outside of the favour and the fruitfulness that God would want for His people. Uh, uh, God, through the prophet Joel, uh, uh, came before God, uh, and God, what what God wanted was God ordained mourning. For, for the ministers and for the pe for the, and then the people uh, to lead them to a place of repentance and repentance is when we turn we do a 180 and we turn from where we're going and we head back to God and so uh, Joel here is uh, is told by God to say to the people you need to you need to be in a process of mourning you need to uh, to to put on this sackcloth which is where people would know your uh, even from the outside that you were in a, a position of mourning, put on sackcloth and, uh, and mourn your lifestyle. That is what's happening is, is, is through this mourning, you would start to cry out to God. These Israelites would cry out to God and they would turn from their ways and turn back to living a life that God would want for them. And so it's not a mourning of a lost loved one. It's a mourning of their actions, a mourning of their lifestyle and them saying, OK, I am going to do my best to turn from that, to repent from that and turn back to God. Because I think often as Christians, we are so uh, we, we can get really like uh, uh, desensitized to our, our, our actions 
Um, I think if we're being honest with ourselves, then we would all have moments in our lives uh, where, we, we, where we become desensitised to what we do and to what we see and to what we say. Uh, we can almost get to the stage where we ignore uh, what we're doing in our lives uh, and we can argue it or we could reason it for the reason why we do so. Oh, well, I do that because of this. Uh, we're actually, it's uh, uh, a case where God would, would, would want us to live a holy life, a whole life, a blameless life. God calls us to mourn over our lifestyle. Are we really ready to, to acknowledge and to, to say that as, as people, as Christians, as, as children of God, then we are ready to get on our knees uh, and cry out before God? Uh, are we really going to get on our knees and cry out before God for the things that are happening in our lives that maybe don't bring God the honour and the glory that he would deserve? You know, when my dad passed away in 2016 from a, a, a degenerative illness called MSA, the day he passed away, I, I, I started a process of mourning him, of, of grief, crying out with pain and with anguish. Um, and mourning started uh, uh, in me a process to engage with a new reality, a new reality of, of not having a, a dad around anymore. And so maybe mourning is, is the same for us with our sin, is that mourning, if we start to mourn our sin, it starts off a process of creating in us a new reality where we can move away from those things and live more of a life that is like Christ. There's a famous theologian called Charles Spurgeon, and he says these words, the holier a man becomes, the more he mourns the unholiness which remains in him. Let me say those words again. The holier a man becomes, the more he mourns the unholiness which remains in him. What that is boiling down to is that the closer we get to God, the more we see our own imperfections. As we draw closer to him, as we get uh, uh, into greater levels of what we would call spiritual maturity, the more it, all of our imperfections will be highlighted to us and we would want to deal with them more. You know, we all have stuff going on in our lives. I hope you know that just because I'm uh, uh, in the fortunate position to be a pastor doesn't mean I'm in any way perfect. Uh, I'm not immune from making bad choices or, or letting life get in the way of my faith or having uh, 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 things that, that don't glorify God, even in my own life. Um, and I, often I thought when I, was, when I was a baby Christian, the fact that I did stuff wrong meant that I wasn't spiritually mature or getting uh, into greater levels of spiritual maturity. Uh, but I've, I've come to learn that spiritual maturity is not getting away from sin. It's not getting away from doing bad things. It's not getting away from uh, the things that, that may hold us back. Because temptation and trials are always going to be there for a Christian. The devil is, is working and he knows what buttons to press. But spiritual maturity isn't avoiding uh, it isn't avoiding sin, it's about knowing how to battle sin. It's knowing about how to face up to it. Spiritual maturity isn't in the absence of sin and temptation. I believe that spiritual maturity is knowing how to come to God with those trials, with those temptations, and using his strength and his might to battle through it. So the morning that we're talking about uh, it's about getting on our knees before Jesus and crying out for him to change us. Is there steps that you can take in your life today that would take you to greater levels of spiritual maturity by knowing how to battle sin and wage war against it in our lives? There's a guy in the Bible called Paul. He's famous for, for writing much of the New Testament. Uh, and he writes some words to the church in Rome. It's in the book of Romans. 
Uh, and it's the end of verse 7 going into chapter 8. If Again, you're following on a Bible. The words aren't going to be on the screen, but if you're following on a Bible, you may want to get those ready. That's Romans 7. And it's almost like Paul is giving us a, a recipe, uh, some kind of three-step process of how to come to God with what's going on in our lives. So when we face these times of, of trouble, when we face these times of anguish, uh, 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 and when we when we recognise that we need to mourn the sin that's in our lives, uh, uh, how do we do that? What does that actually look like? Well, Paul says these words in the end of Romans 7, which is verse 21. He says, I have discovered the principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you will see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So now there is no condemnation to those who belong in Christ Jesus. Paul wrestled with uh, this in his heart that he really wanted to do what is right. He wanted to do what is holy. He wanted to do what was pleasing to God uh, in God's eyes. Uh, you know, what was glorifying of God. But just like each one of us, he struggled. And Paul is one of the most influential men in the whole of Christianity. He was uh, full of the Holy Spirit and he saw miracles and miraculous things and he, he, he did fantastic things in the name of God. Yet even he struggled with his sin. But here is an example of a man who is mourning the sin in his life. He's crying out to God. He's grieving how he is living, wanting to become a better example of Christ in his life. He has this three step process. Number one, he mourned his sin. Number two, he then rejoiced in Christ Jesus and who he was in Christ Jesus. And then number three, the third step of the three step process is that he remembered the promises of Jesus that he was no longer a condemned man. So let's just go into that in, in just a, a small uh, bit of detail. Number one, Paul mourned his sin. Paul recognised that in his life there was there was lots of mess. Uh, he doesn't make excuses for it. He doesn't reason uh, for it. But he acknowledges uh, uh, what's what's going on in his life. Uh, uh, and he's saying, I know what I want to do. I know what is right to do. I know the, the, the path which I should take. But often my mind makes me do other things. Often he's saying sometimes I feel powerless. Well, even when I know I want to do the right thing, I end up doing the wrong thing. And so Paul is recognising this in his own life. And this, this process of, of mourning starts uh, wholesome and healing in his life. Uh, he knows his relationship with God is vitally important. So step number one, Paul is is mourning his sin. He's crying out to God. He's acknowledging before God and before others as well what's happening in his life. And he's saying, I need help to do what is right. I need help from God to do it because I can't do it in my own strength. I can't do it with my own body. I need God to help me. Number two, thanking God is such an important thing. Thanking uh, uh, the very nature of Christ. He says, thank God in, in one of the verses. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. When we are in this process, when we are mourning our sin, it's important to, to, uh, is to have one eye on, on what we're doing, but also to have one eye on Jesus is to know that regardless of what is happening, regardless of how much we are struggling, 
we can still thank Jesus for our lives and still thank Jesus for who he is, for who he is and what he's done for us. The answer uh, to dealing with our sin in our lives, he says, is found in Christ. Jesus Christ has taken it all already when he died on the cross. And so we bring all of our messes, all of our mistakes, all of the rubbish that's in our life. And we say, thank you, God. Because the answer to all of that is that one day we will see our lives in wholeness when we see Jesus in heaven. Thanks be to God that he has already sorted it. That even though we are in this, uh, this time this, 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 this time where we struggle and we're still dealing with sin, we know that God, you have already conquered it. Jesus, you have already conquered it. And then from this encouragement, he states that uh, at the end of those verses, when we lead into, into Romans 8 verse 1, that there is no condemnation. There is no condemnation to those who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. That anything that's happening within our lives, there is no condemnation for that. Jesus sees me. He sees Ryan. He didn't see Ryan uh, with my mistakes. He doesn't see Ryan as, uh, uh, as Ryan with all my troubles and the things that I get wrong. He looks at me and he sees Ryan who is innocent and who is blameless because of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. He looks at us. He doesn't see conduct. He, he doesn't want to condemn us for our actions. But he judges us as co heirs, as people who have accepted Jesus and therefore are blameless in the eyes of God. Everything got rid of, everything washed away. There's a, uh, a saying I'd love to share with you as we sort of come towards a bit of an ending. He says, those who learn to mourn over their sin find the heart of God and intimate fellowship with God is the foundation of true happiness. Those who learn to mourn over their sin find the heart of God and intimate fellowship with God is the foundation of true happiness. Could mourning our sin bring us closer to God? You know, when we mourn our sin, what we're doing is actively seeking him as we lean on God for his strength and for his guidance. And so it's not just sorting out our mess and our mistakes, and, but it's actively bringing us closer into the presence of God. And so maybe... Just maybe you have been a Christian for forever uh, and for a while you haven't been like feeling it. You haven't sensed God in a long time or you're starting to doubt or question. Maybe there's something in your life. There, there's some uh, behavioural patterns or some actions that you're taking or some way that, that you may be living that you could mourn to God and that would draw you closer to him. As we actively seek him for forgiveness, but also for change and transformation. As we say to God, I can't do it on my own. I need your strength. I need your guidance. I need you to show me and help me through this. Could it be that these Beatitudes as a whole, but especially this one, starts this counter-cultural approach that would bring about his righteousness in us. And so church, my question to you is, are we prepared not just to just be blasé with our faith? That when we mess up, uh, instead of just saying, oh, it happened again, are we prepared to get on our knees and seek him as a church? Because you know, as a, as a church, we are wanting to make it better in every aspect of our life. And what could be better than seeing us as a church become more like Christ. That we can show the change that God has made in us to people who don't know Jesus because we have mourned our lifestyles, we have mourned the sin that's in our lives and that we have come to God and he has 
changed us. And that when he changes us, people see that. I firmly believe that. So I challenge us. I challenge each one of us in our church, including myself, that this week we take steps to actively mourn the sin that's in our life. We actively mourn what holds us back. Maybe, like I've said, those behavioural patterns, maybe those thoughts or those actions. And we say to God, God, would you help me? I don't want to live like this anymore. God, I want to live a life that, that honours you, that gives you glory, that is worthy of the life that you have called me to. And that when we do that, when God comes, he gives us his Holy Spirit to comfort us in those times of mourning so that we know we are not going through this life alone. But we are going through it with the Holy Spirit that wants to guide and protect us, to fill us, to give us everything we need to be effective as Christians on this earth. I believe, church, we can make it better. We don't want to be sit on the fence Christians. We want to be all in Christians. When you're all in Christians, you say to God, God, would you change me? And I believe that God honours that, honours that when we seek him and give him our all. Church, let me pray for us. And this is maybe something that you want to put into practice. Maybe each morning or each evening you cry out to God and you say to him, God, illuminate in me. Search my heart, oh God, it says in the Psalms, and find any offensive way in me. You may just want to pray that psalm over your life and see what God says to you in these moments. Church, let us pray together. Father, we thank you for your work on the cross and we thank you that we stand here uh, uh, as people today, as children of God, who were on a process to being transformed into people who, who, who are blameless. That you see us now as blameless, but we still have things in our life that we can change and we can work at so that we honour you with everything that we say and do. And so, Father, we, we, we pray that we can lay the how on anything that is holding us back. Some things will be really attractive uh, 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 and some things will be really easy to do. Some, some of it may be really hard. But we pray we come to our place where our heart breaks when we do something that doesn't give you honour and glory. Change us, transform us, Lord, we pray. We love you. We give you ourselves today. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. We've now reached the time in the service where we give our financial offerings to God. If you're not a regular part of our church, or if you are under any current significant financial pressure at this moment in time due to the pandemic, we do not want you to feel obliged to give in this way. If you're a regular giver through the buckets in church, we want to let you know that you can give electronically. The details of how you can do that is on the screen, as well as a QR code where you hover your phone over the QR code and it will take you to our website where you can enter your details. If you're still managing to give through this period in time, we are so thankful for what you're doing. It's helping loads in the life of the church and the impact it's making in the society around us. So thank you so much for that. We're going to have a little bit of worship right now. We should give you time to arrange your giving. And we thank you again so much for how you're still giving in this way.
the end of our Sunday service. If you're part of our kids' church, remember at 12 o'clock on YouTube and on Facebook Live, the guys are excited about seeing you there. For everybody else, if you want to stay updated with what's going on in the life of our church, check out our website and our social media channels. We want you to stay safe, stay blessed, and have a great week.